football. I've been watching it for 40 years. Are you kidding me? You're listening to Winning Cures Everything. Game day, baby. Wake up or get out. Here's your host. A confident young man. A superb athlete. Gary Seegers. Welcome in. It is Winning Cures Everything, powered by BetUS. That's right, BetUS, where the game begins. They are the presenting sponsor of the show this season, and we are very excited to welcome them back into the fold. Of course, they were with us last football season as well. This go-round, I am a one-man operation, but that is okay. We are going to continue this thing rolling Again, in case you missed it on the last hour of many shows, the format will go like this. Sunday morning, we will have a live recap and reaction show for the college football weekend that was, and then the podcast will come out on Monday morning. And then we will have a show on Tuesday night. The podcast will come out on Wednesday morning. That show on Tuesday, you can only get the full show on the podcast on Wednesday morning. So make sure that you are subscribed on the podcast. But there will be clips and whatnot that will be put out, of course, along with that. And, of course, we have a Thursday evening show that's going to preview the weekend ahead, etc., all the different games. That show will be at 6 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. Eastern. So make sure that you are tuned in for that on YouTube. Podcast will be out on Friday. So, uh, lots to discuss. Uh, Happy anniversary, happy birthday, whatever you want to say, to the Alliance. The Big Ten, the Pac-12, and the ACC one year and one day ago, decided that they were going to join together. But they didn't need a contract, right? You remember all this. Didn't need a contract, and that's okay, because less than a year later, of course, the Big Ten swapped up USC and UCLA. They grabbed them and took them and signed a new media deal with them. So, interesting stuff. We've got a lot to cover today. Again, it is Thursday, August 25th. I certainly appreciate all of you that are watching currently. If you would, so kindly go ahead and hit that like button and make sure that you subscribe to the channel if you have not done so already. If you're not already subscribed over on the BetUS College Football Show as well, we just hit 4,000 subscribers over there. Uh, I am currently at here on Winning Cures Everything almost to 6,800. The goal is 7,500 for the season. Uh, might have undersold that a little bit, but uh, but once we get to 7,500, we will set a new goal. So, But for the BetUS College Football Show, first show, the Week Zero show, was on Tuesday. So go and check that out. Always a good time there. Uh, but yes, we are now a little over 4,000 subscribers there, and the goal for the season is 5K. We might get to 5,000 by the end of Week 1. Very possible. But make sure that you are subscribed over there as well. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, let's dive into the topics for today. We will start off with topic number one, and that is Notre Dame is the only team that is named in the Big Ten Escalator Clause. Now, this, of course, was done over at the Sports Business Journal. Uh, They say CBS, Fox, and NBC know exactly how much extra they will have to pay as part of their rights deal with the Big Ten if the conference were to land Notre Dame within the next seven years. It says that specific dollar figure, which is not publicly known, is spelled out in the contracts. And as you see highlighted here on your screen, no other school is mentioned in these deals by name, and the contracts do not assign a dollar figure to any other school that may join the conference, according to sources. Now, this is interesting because, of course, we did talk on the show on Monday about the fact that Oregon was in Chicago meeting with Big Ten reps, and by Oregon, I mean representatives for the University of Oregon, uh, they were in Chicago talking about whether or not they would be a good fit for this conference, etc. cetera. Uh, Notre Dame is the only one, and I think that that's a pretty big deal. You know, I, I'm not sure uh, what to make of it exactly, but we do know that if Notre Dame should join in the next couple of years, and there's still a lot to be figured out. Of course, we reported, we reported, there were reports last week about the figure looks like it could be about $60 million for their media rights deal for their next television package. And that's uh, that's a pretty big deal. So this uh, this is interesting because it really means that Notre Dame is the one giant that the Big Ten is going after. And we kind of already knew that, right? But along with that, I don't know that Oregon is necessarily 
uh, the other top dog that they are looking at. And that is where things kind of get thrown in here. I mean, I did say it before. If Oregon, or if the Big Ten had wanted Oregon to package along with USC and UCLA, Oregon would be in the conference. Like, it, it, that deal would already be done. So, now, of course, there's other things that have to go on inside of the state government, etc. There are people inside of the government that are trying to make it where if Oregon goes, then Oregon State has to go, etc. And that would put a kibosh on the whole thing. So, I would not expect that to happen, but just to say, there's some crazy stuff happening. So, regardless. But Notre Dame, only team named in the Big Ten contract escalator clause. That is interesting, to say the least. Now, that will take us over to an interesting article over at 538. And let me go and get this pulled up on the screen here. Nate Silver did this one actually today, same day that we were doing this. Says, where should the Big Ten expand next? We crunched the numbers. Now, he goes through and basically says that... uh, How about that? Let's frame it first, okay? He's trying to figure out the candidates that fit the Big Ten. The ones for expansion. If the Big Ten is going to uh, jump out to 20 league members, 20 conference members, uh, you know, everybody knows about Notre Dame already. But who else is the best fit? Because there's more that goes into it than just TV eyeballs, right? When you're getting a conference together especially a giant conference, you need academic fit, you need uh, culture fit, you need, uh, of course, the eyeballs help as well, you need sports uh, to be competitive, you need all kinds of different things. So, he went through and put together a formula that is really interesting. Uh, Basically, he's saying that Rutgers was never a fit, that one made zero sense, but at the time, obviously, it did make a ton of sense. Uh, You wanted as many eyeballs as possible from that New York, New Jersey market. And when it comes to cable subscribers, now remember that was just 2012, 2013, whatever it was. They were trying to capitalize on the amount of people that are in that market. The market size doesn't necessarily matter now. What you're looking for is people that are going to be able to pay subscriptions. Uh, The size of the market does matter somewhat when it comes to, uh, you know, actually putting together good games, etc., and games that people will be watching. So you want as many eyeballs as possible, but Rutgers is never going to draw that many people. I mean, let's just call a spade a spade. All right, so he rolls through this, and he talks about the different categories, right? Basically, there are uh, just a ton of expansion candidates. So all ACC schools, all Pac-12 schools other than UCLA and USC, all Big 12 schools except for Texas and Oklahoma, SEC schools, Missouri and Vanderbilt, Notre Dame, UConn, uh, group of five schools, Cincinnati, Houston, Rice, and SMU. Um, And that's 38 schools that he's going through, that he's going to measure them in three broad categories. He said sports, fit, and market. Now, he's going through, he explains the process. You you should really go over to 538.com and check this out. Uh, But it goes through, you know, sports, not just football, but everything else, because you're not just bringing them in as a football member, you'll bring them in both as a colleague, a sister school, if you will, and also to compete in all of the other sports. So it goes through and it gives different sports scores. Notre Dame, of course, the highest, the next highest as far as sports goes from the available candidates is Oklahoma State. Then you've got North Carolina, Oregon, Stanford, Clemson, Florida State, Utah, Washington, and so forth and so on. West Virginia, actually higher than Miami. (laughs) A little bit surprising. But regardless, um, as far as fit, it goes through. He said uh, some of the characteristics that describe current Big Ten schools he's already discussed. Uh, mostly public schools with very large enrollments, good research programs. It says all but Nebraska are members of the AAU. No current Big Ten members have a religious affiliation. Most are flagship schools in their states. They're all at least decent academically, and some have good or great academics. Uh, so the geographic part doesn't matter. So academic ranking, AAU membership, enrollment, SPF, which is Secular Public Flagship, that's a two times multiplier for him, and rivalries. So there are a lot of things here. Who is the best fit? California. So the Cal Golden Bears. 
actually fit the best as far as this goes. But beyond that, Washington, North Carolina, Virginia, Arizona, Pitt, Colorado, Stanford, and so forth and so on. Uh, the Stanford thing really surprised me. But the biggest thing is because they're not a public school. Uh, the enrollment is a little bit lower. But as far as rivalries go, that certainly bumps them up quite a bit. So a uh, lot to look into there. Uh, as far as the market goes. Now, we can dive into a bunch of this. College football TV ratings, media market footprint, all sport revenues, popularity on Google Trends. Now, this is where it gets crazy. Notre Dame, Florida State, Oregon, Clemson, Miami, North Carolina, TCU, Washington, Baylor. So, we go through, and you can look at the composite score for all of the existing Big Ten schools. The ones that do not fit. Rutgers, Northwestern, Purdue, Maryland, Indiana, Illinois, and Nebraska. Those are all under 60. Now, if you look at the candidates, you've got Notre Dame at a 73 composite score. Uh, they don't really fit, but the market size and the sports certainly help. Tier 2, you've got North Carolina, Oregon, Florida State, and Washington. Pretty awesome. Like I, that, Those four would be a massive grab, even if you could not get Notre Dame away from being independent. Now, of course, there are two ACC schools in there. Eh, really difficult. And, and I think the SEC would be willing to fight somebody over North Carolina. But regardless. Uh, then you move down to Tier 3. These are the ones that fall under that 60 mark. But Clemson, even right here, is higher than the majority. I say the majority. Than a lot of those teams that are at the bottom. They're a better fit. Uh, a better uh, Big Ten candidate than even Nebraska. So, sports, 57. Fit, 44. Market, 75. Their composite is a 59. Beyond that, you've got Utah with a 54. Miami, 53. Stanford, 53. And Cal, 52. So, I think what we're saying here is, mm, Cal may not work. But the issue here, of course, is that if you are stuck and you have to bring in four more Pac-12 schools, Cal would be the most likely fourth one, right? The academics fit, the sports, eh, it's whatever. But as far as the as far as the fit goes, it's 87 academically for sure. The market is a 24, but the biggest part of that, like while it is in the Bay Area, nobody cares about Cal athletics at all. Uh, as far as sports go, you know, 44, they're just not super competitive at anything. But the academic side would certainly help things. They are in the Bay Area. You might be able to get that market share up a little bit. But uh, this was an interesting, interesting article. Well worth the read. Go check out Nate Silver over at 538. It's going to move us over to Burke Magnus, the ESPN president of programming and and original content, he went on with the Sports Business Journal uh, the other day. Wait, it, not even necessarily the Sports Business Journal. It was uh, Marshand and Orand, uh, their podcast, and really talked about just a bunch of different things. He started off by saying that the ESPN dropping out of the Big Ten rights negotiations was the right move for them. And it definitely makes sense, right? Uh, he said that... Let's see. Let me let me look at exactly what he said here. Uh, ABC had carried Big Ten games as far back as 1966. ESPN has done the same beginning in 1979. ESPN was reportedly offered a package that would have seen them paying $380 million per year, but that only covered primetime football games and only would have been for about 13 games a year, which is less than half of their current 27-game package, which they were paying around $190 million a year for. Uh, they turned that down, and ESPN president... Uh, Burke Magnus spoke to John Orand of the Sports Business Journal uh, about that this week on Marshand and Orand. Uh, this is, he said we needed to get at the price that we needed to get it at, and neither of those things were available to us. It makes perfect sense to me. I mean, it, it, if you were paying $190 million for twice as much as something, even though the supply has gone down, is it is it a good deal to go and make that deal? I don't think so. I think I think Magnus made the right call here. Um, this is a really good interview. You should you should really go listen to uh, the full interview. I am. What we need I'm going to play this to get at the 
price that we needed to get it at, neither of those things were available to us. And so, you know, as difficult as it was to go separate directions, um, you know, it was the right decision for our company. There's no doubt about that. We're going to continue to be heavily invested in college sports. Nothing is forever in the rights buying business. So you got to be somewhat dispassionate about and stick to your process, if you will. Um, but it was hard. It was a hard decision, uh, but I think it was the right decision for us. Most now, he does bring up something very interesting. And that's going to take us to our next point here. ESPN uh, believes that they will still dominate college football coverage even without the Big Ten. It says the network expects to have 64% of 18 to 49 viewership. That's 18 to 49 years of age, uh, the demographic there, uh, in 2024 with its new SEC package. ESPN will also go after the Big 12, Pac-12, and the college football playoff renewal, a source told Front Office Sports. Now, the article here, it's very short, uh, but it says ESPN could still dominate a large share despite losing the Big Ten, and it it projects that it will garner 63% of all college football viewership minutes for people between the ages of 18 and 49. Now, that's only a 1% drop-off from the 2021-2022 numbers. Now, ESPN not having the Big Ten is a big deal, but they are going to go after the Big 12 and the Pac-12 big time. They they could even overpay for those leagues, and and it still be worth it to be able to combat what Fox, CBS, and NBC have with the Big Ten. Now, the Big Ten may end up becoming a bigger overall brand, but when it comes down to it, I mean, you this is exactly what they need to have happen. Uh, Burke Magnus also talked about the uh, Pac-12 contract. Um Basically, he said that the Pac-12 contract, if they get a deal done with them between ESPN and the Pac-12, it will include room for expansion candidates. Now, he said, we don't even need to know who those candidates will be. There will be an escalator clause in there, and and the deal will go up a little bit if they bring in somebody that is, you know, that's worthwhile. And basically, that points us right back to the Mountain West Conference, which, I mean, San Diego State is the most likely. They don't have to bring in two more, but they could. If they just bring in San Diego State, that's one thing. But you could go in and bring in Boise State as well. Or, uh, I mean, we'll talk about a couple of other things with Bob Thompson and John Canzano here in just a little while. But there's a lot of options. I mean, you could get Fresno State in there. You could get UNLV, et cetera. We, we'll talk about all of this uh, later on. Let's go ahead and hit an ad, uh, and we will talk about some more interesting things regarding the Pac-12 on the backside. Let's check out some things you should know about. Visit winningcureseverything.com to find everything you need to know about us, including full shows in video or podcast form, gambling picks, merch, the gear we use, and more. If you want more content from me, Gary, visit betustv.com. I host the How to Gamble on Sports show, and from August through January, the Bet US College Football Show. You can subscribe to both on YouTube. If you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or whatever's your favorite podcast app. And if your app allows it, leave a five star written review. Visit the Winning Cures Everything web store to get all kinds of football shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and more. Visit winningcureseverything.com slash store to see what all we've added. And now, Back to the show. All right. Jason Shear. That's the name that I forgot the other day, but he's over at Wildcat Authority. He and Matt Brown both have been filing FOIA requests. That's F-O-I-A, Freedom of Information Act requests. Because of some crazy stuff that George Klyovkov, the Pac-12 commissioner, said at his media days just uh, about a month ago or so. Now, the tweet here says uh, from Jason Shear, interesting that I made a few FOIA requests to Pac-12 schools asking for the Big 12 tampering that was forwarded to George Klyovkov and have been told there are no responsive records. Matt Brown from Extra Points, who is the king of the FOIAs, he jumped in and said the same thing. Same, although not everybody has gotten back to me yet. He said, I think my request was more broad than what Jason asked for, though, and I'm prepared to pay for the search. In my experience, 
These requests at many Pac-12 schools take forever. Now, my guess is that Jason reached out to Utah, to Colorado, to Arizona, and to Arizona State. Those are the four schools that it, it has been widely reported, it has been rumored that those four are maybe interested in joining the Big 12, and those are the ones that the Big 12 would want. They fit geographically. They seem to fit culturally. We'll see. But there's a lot of questions, right? A lot of questions about this. Uh, but as it sits right now, it kind of looks like there was no Big 12 tampering with Pac-12 schools, that the Pac-12 schools, honestly, may have just reached out to the Big 12. Uh, wouldn't you do the same thing? If the two uh, bell cows of your conference, if the two biggest brands in your conference, and, and maybe we could debate whether or not UCLA is the second biggest brand, but regardless, go with me here, right? Uh, if those two big brands leave your conference and you don't know exactly what's going on heading into your next media rights deal, but you understand that you've only got 10 members left and the slightest bit of instability could wreck the whole conference and you could be stuck without a home, would you not reach out? Now, that's not tampering. That's nothing along that is tampering if the university reaches out to the other conference first, right? That's why the SEC was not accused of tampering. That's why the Big Ten was not accused of tampering either. So there's a lot of questions here that you have to figure out. Uh, but it looks like uh, from everything that we can see right now, there was no Big 12 tampering. This was just conference schools in the Pac-12 reaching out to the Big 12, trying to look for stability to see what might be out there. And I don't blame them one bit. Not one bit. Interesting story from the state of Alabama. Rich Rodriguez. Now, I, I tweeted this the other day, uh, but I've never actually fully thought about the fact that Rich Rod was one win away from a national championship appearance at West Virginia. Of course, he was upset by Pitt that year. Dave Wanstead, what up? Uh, he was almost the Alabama football coach instead of Nick Saban decided to stay at West Virginia, and now he is the head football coach at Jacksonville State. That's right, FCS program that is going to be moving to Conference USA in the FBS next year, but for right now, he is the Jacksonville State Gamecocks head coach, and this guy, let me go on and tell you, uh, he is fired up. They play Stephen F. Austin uh, in their first game. And he, he is claiming Stephen F. Austin sent a spy with a camera to watch them practice. Now, I'm going to play this and, and let you hear exactly what he says. It's not long, but it is interesting. Pretty good source was true that they had a couple staff members at our spring game, which is kind of like uh, that's not really supposed to happen. But um, no, we're, we're, we're making plans accordingly. You know, if they, so if, they, if they're over there thinking they have our – plays or what have you or signals or something like that we've changed things since the spring then we caught somebody trying to film something the other day and uh first my daughter called raquel saw him and then i then we caught him again saw him you know peering through there with his camera and i sent the biggest guy in our program his crew one of our assistant strength coach she's about like six seven three fifty probably benches like uh a thousand pounds or something sent him up to bleachers to run him out and uh that guy disappeared pretty quick this is interesting, right? It, at every level of this sport, there are people that are trying to cheat or get some kind of an advantage. Maybe we shouldn't call it cheat. If the spring game is open, that's it. that's totally... If you don't want people watching the spring game, close it, right? Now, we hope that these programs don't do that. But uh, this is incredibly interesting to me because I have not heard of it like this at the FCS level. You know it has to happen, but you don't normally hear coaches talk about it publicly, right? Uh, this happens everywhere. It's happened in the NFL. It happens in regular FBS. People just don't talk about it, but it has caused quite the stir with all of this right now. I, I can't wait to see what this looks like. If Jacksonville State gets beat in this game, are they going to come out and talk about this? I mean, it, it leads down a whole bunch of different paths. 
and I'm excited to hear what's going to happen for sure. Uh, we do have some some funny stuff that I've got to talk about. Got to talk about it. You know what it is. <sighs> South Carolina, you crazy, crazy, crazy fans uh, and crazy, I mean, boosters or whatever you want to call them. This is the most college football thing I have ever seen. South Carolina's live rooster mascot is getting a new name. So, of course, the state uh, over in South Carolina decided that they were going to do a poll. And we'll talk about the names here in a minute. But here's the situation. It says, A new alias for the mascot, formerly known as Sir Big Spur, will be announced sometime between now and when the Gamecocks kick off the season, September 3rd against Georgia State, the university confirmed to the state. Why a name change? It boils down to a disagreement between the Bird's original owners, Mary Snelling, and Ron Albertelli. Now, uh, oh, and the new owners, Beth and Van Clark, over whether or not the animal's comb on its head should be trimmed. It says, uh, according to a report from the Charleston Post and Courier, the original owners trimmed the rooster's comb, the red fleshy area on its head, to make the bird look more like a fighting gamecock. The Clarks have opted to keep the comb intact, citing the health benefits to the bird. An agreement with the original owners allowing the use of the Sir Big Spur name has expired and USC is now guiding the process to select a new name. Uh, this is interesting. It says the university's legal team advised against an old name or against using an old name, Big Spur, which was suggested by fans um, because th this is not owned by the university, which is hilarious to me. Now, the big, the big suit guy, the big mascot that all the kids get to hug and shake hands with, that's Cocky, Cocky the Gamecock. But the live mascot, the rooster that is there at the football games, etc. Here are the names that they <laughs> recommended. And I'm going to vote on the show so that you can actually see it right here. Uh, but the names that they came up with. General, Coop or Cooper, Cock Commander. <laughs> what are we doing? Uh, Kicking Chicken, Captain Cluck. Brewster, Cluck Norris, Marco Pollo, Mr. Chicken Scratch, and Cockadoodle Dude. Now, obviously, you know which one that I am going to vote for, but I want to see what the... Yeah, yeah, this, this was bound to happen. 78% of the votes are in for Cock Commander. I don't think there's any way that the university actually does this, but my God, if they did... Oh... I mean, you want to talk about awesome? Uh, I I couldn't even I couldn't even begin. Number two on this list, uh, with only five percent of the vote, is Cluck Norris. Number four is Coop. Number three, General. You know, you had people that started maybe voting for the more serious ones, but man, I mean, what are we talking about here? Uh, just just bananas, just bananas. All right, moving on from there. Uh, quick note: Tom Herman is joining the CBS Sports Network as an analyst for football games this year. Uh, he was on an NFL staff last year, but is this possibly uh, his way of getting back into the college game and maybe taking a different job? I don't think that Tom Herman is a bad coach. I think he did pretty well at Texas. Obviously, he did incredibly well at Houston, and he was a good offensive coordinator for Urban Meyer at Ohio State. Yes, all the Zach Smith stuff that came out after that, him cheating on his wife, whatever, da 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 Think about him what you want. I understand all of that. I am looking at this as Tom Herman's a good coach. He's probably going to take over a G5 program pretty soon. This is a good way to get back into it, get more acclimated to the college game again after being in the NFL. I think it's a good idea. I think it's a good idea. Hey, you guys tell me, what do you think about Tom Herman? Do you think that this should be uh, a next step for him? You know, move into the TV role, and then you jump back into college? I guess it depends on what he really wants to do. I uh, never really knew him as much, of a, as much of a TV guy. He doesn't seem like he would be a good analyst, but you get on some of those shows, you have some clips like that, you can kind of sell yourself to some of these better Power 5 programs, uh, or excuse me, some of these better G5 programs. I don't know that he's going to take over a Power 5 program. I mean, we'll see. We'll see. Next up on the docket, this one's interesting. 
Now, of course, we've got the uh, the week zero preview coming up on the backside of the ads here. But uh, but John Canzano and Bob Thompson. Now, Canzano, of course, Mr. Pac-12, knows everything that there is to know about everything. He and Bob Thompson, who I've had on the show uh, a couple weeks ago, they got together and geeked out. As it says, geeked out over the media value of Pac-12 schools. Now, this is interesting to me because it actually puts a number with some of these programs. And it lets you know who is worth what, whether it's an expansion or how they're going to get this deal done if the Pac-12 is going to stay together, etc. It says, uh, I'm not a media rights expert. I've never uh, negotiated a television contract, but Bob Thompson, the former Fox Sports Network president, has done hundreds of deals over the years. He's the expert. The Pac-12 conference is currently negotiating with ESPN and some others for its next media rights deal. A few weeks ago, I asked Thompson to take a look at the Pac-12 and reverse engineer some media rights evaluations for the remaining 10 members. Thompson geeked out on the numbers and created a formula to measure market size, television households, football brand, win percentage, Olympic sports, fan support, and men's basketball impact. So his ranking here, it says if they do an equal split, $32.4 million per school it would be a contract of $324 million. I think that would be uh, pretty good. Uh, pretty good, you know, more than what was originally reported, right? Jason Shear came out and said that the initial ESPN deal would have been uh, for, uh, what, $24.5 million per year per school. Not great. This would be uh, about $8 million more than that, so $32.4 million. But he assigned a point value to each team. Washington got the highest at 36, Oregon 34, Stanford 30, Arizona State 25, and then so forth and so on. Uh, Cal is all the way down at 20 on this. Now, he said the figures above are estimated year number one numbers based on a five-year media rights contract with an average annual payout of $350 million. So, after that, uh, he said, let's assume the conference won't make that mistake again uh, as far as, uh, you know, making sure that everybody's okay with whatever. Um, but you get into uh, unequal revenue sharing. This is where it gets a little tricky, right? Because you look at this, and if you do unequal media rights revenue sharing, this is how it could break down. Washington, Oregon, and Stanford all make $38.7 million. Arizona State, Utah, and Cal make $32.3 million each. And then Arizona, Washington State, Colorado, and Oregon State would all get $27.7 million. That's still right around the $324 million per year for ESPN or whoever else may pay up the contract, right? In that situation, you got two schools there, Arizona and Colorado, that might take a serious look at jumping over to the Big 12, which in turn could completely splinter the Pac-12 and whatever is left of this deal, right? Oregon State, I don't think, has anything to complain about. I don't think Washington State has anything to complain about. Oregon, excuse me, Arizona and Colorado, I think, would be able to get more money in the Big 12 than they would if they were to do unequal revenue sharing. Let me go ahead and say this. I've said it on the show before. If you're new to the show, First off, welcome. Please like the video and subscribe, of course. But unequal revenue sharing has been done in the past. It has killed conferences in the past. The value of teams swings drastically, and sometimes on a year-in and year-out basis. So it is interesting to me that this is something that the Pac-12 is considering doing, but they may not have any choice because... If the Big Ten offers, here's the deal. Even if you were to pay Washington and Oregon $38.7 million each and, and pay the other guys less, if the Big Ten comes calling, they're still going to go. As it sits right now, why would you go unequal revenue sharing with these guys based on the fact that they might stick around? Like, no, the Big Ten is always going to offer them more money. Like, that's the bottom line. So if you're worried about losing them to somebody like the Big Ten, that threat is always going to be there. So why would you pay them more as it is? Like Your biggest thing is making sure that you keep Arizona and Colorado and those guys happy. So don't do the unequal revenue sharing. But 
it is at least interesting to think about, right? At least to me. All right, we're going to hit a couple of ads, and then we are jumping into our Week Zero preview. Don't go anywhere. Let's check out some things you should know about. Follow the show on Twitter at Winning Cures, and you can follow Gary at Gary WCE. You can also follow on Facebook. Got your own podcast or web show? Looking to start one, or you're just curious how we look and sound so good? Well, we've got all the gear that we use listed on our gear page on the website. If you order using our links, you'll be supporting the show too. Subscribe on YouTube to get not only full Winning Cures Everything shows, but individual segments and other goodies as well. We're over 6,000 subscribers, and our goal by the end of the year is 7,500. If you're interested in advertising on a show that reaches over 80,000 unique football fans per month during the season, send an email to Gary at winningcureseverything.com, and we'll put together a plan that best fits you or your business. And now, back to the show. All right. I have no idea what happened there, but regardless... (laughs) More kinks that we got to work out on the new format. Uh, by the way, there's more good stuff coming next week. So, just so you know what's going on. Make sure you are subscribed and like the video for me if you've not done so already. And subscribe to the podcast. We are going to have some exclusive stuff on the podcast. So, you might want to make sure that you've got that for next week. Because it starts up on Sunday. Oh, by the way, the show on Sunday will not be live. I have to be out of town for something that I did not expect. So, uh, I will record the show. And I will be posting it. Uh, But the Week Zero reaction and recap will not be live this Sunday. I will post it up. It'll premiere. We can all watch it together. It'll be a good time. But just keep that on the back burner. It won't be live. But I would love for you guys to jump into the chat and tell me what you thought about the games from Saturday. Now, moving on. The Week Zero appointment viewing guide for the College Football Week Zero. I'm, uh, I'm pumped about this. Now, created this, uh, just a simple Google Sheet, whatever. And we are going to start off with the must-see games. All right? Uh, The ones that, if you are a diehard, if you are uh, a sicko, as they would call it, I would recommend watching these games. Nebraska against Northwestern on Fox. It's at 12.30 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, That one It goes head-to-head with CBS Sports Network, Austin P. at Western Michigan. uh, Excuse me, Western Kentucky. But uh, Nebraska and Northwestern think this is going to be a very interesting matchup. Of course, it is a huge year for Scott Frost and that bunch, but also for uh, Pat Fitzgerald and the Wildcats. Now, I'm going to talk more about this game here in just a little bit, but uh, big game. Big, big game. I think uh, it's going to be fun to watch, entertaining to see what these teams look like because both of them went 3-9 and last year. Yeah. Not great. Uh, as far as the afternoon games, you know, this is when you might want to get some stuff done. Maybe. Uh, but we we shall see on that. Uh, let's see. Let's, uh, let's pause. All right, let's get this thing back on the rails here. Wyoming at Illinois starts at 4 p.m. Eastern time. This one is on the Big Ten Network. Here is what I see about this game. I don't know that you are going to get your best effort out of Illinois. They play at Indiana, which is a Big Ten Conference opponent next week. That is obviously the bigger game. Wyoming should be completely outmatched in this game. Would it surprise me if Wyoming stays within the spread? Absolutely not. Uh, But other than that, you know, you've got UConn and Utah State. That should be an absolute bludgeoning. But again, Utah State plays Alabama next week. Are they going to go vanilla against UConn knowing that they can just get the win? Like, what are you actually going to see here? Florida State and Duquesne also comes on. I think that one's a 4.30 or 5 o'clock kick uh, on ACC Network. Eh, you know, whatever. Like, it, it, Florida State should absolutely destroy them. As far as the other must-see games, I've got two of them, and they are both Conference USA games. Charlotte at FAU is an incredibly interesting game. This was 38-9 to FAU last year, and it was at Charlotte. Uh, but... It gets a little tricky, right? Uh, There were some missed opportunities for Charlotte. uh, And eventually, FAU just took over and steamrolled them in the second half. But it was 9-7, to Charlotte, at the half. Now, FAU got some interceptions, uh, took advantage of, like, some missed fourth downs, etc. There were big plays that were handled by FAU. As far as talent goes, FAU should demolish them. But 
eh, Willie Taggart against Will Healy. Like, I like Will Healy. I like what he's doing. And there's a lot of coaching change over at FAU. Also, must watch, and this may be the best game of the night, if you can find stadium, okay? North Texas at UTEP, sold out Sun Bowl Stadium. I am pumped about this one. I'm so excited to watch the Miners against the North Texas Mean Green for a multitude of reasons, right? Dana DeMel against Seth Luttrell. Uh, this is these are two teams that shouldn't like each other, but uh, but it's a pretty far drive from Dallas to El Paso. Uh, Dallas Denton. How about this Denton, Texas, which is where North Texas is. Uh, and I've made that drive, and it is a brutal stretch. It's a little over eight hours. I mean, it's rough, really, really rough. But, man, UTEP fans are excited about this one. I mean, they are going to have that place sold out, sold out for a conference game. Uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun, a lot of fun. And that one is, of course, at 9 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, Vanderbilt at Hawaii is the 10.30 Eastern time kick on CBS Sports Network. I don't know, what, like, Hawaii – is a small football team. I don't know how much actual FBS talent there is on that roster. Timmy Chang coming in, a lot of coaching turnover there. They had a bunch of guys transfer out because of the Todd Graham stuff, etc. That one's going to get nasty. Um, and then Florida a and I say nasty. It may not. I mean, it just Vanderbilt isn't that good either. But I think Vanderbilt's a lot better than, than Hawaii, for sure. Uh, then you've also got Florida a and at North Carolina. Uh, North Carolina should, should smoke them. Absolutely. And on ESPN2, uh, 10 p.m.? Uh, yeah, 10 p.m. kick, Eastern Time. Nevada at New Mexico State. Yuck. I mean, just a gross game. Gross, gross, gross. Uh, I mean, I don't know what you're going to learn about either one of those teams. They're both really bad. It's uh, Jerry Kill's uh, debut, and it's Ken Wilson's debut. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, but I don't think that's uh, worth watching. It, it, if you can get to North Texas and UTEP, that's going to be the game to watch. And if you decide to turn that one off, you can always switch over to Vanderbilt and Hawaii on CBS Sports Network. Okay, we have some interesting games that we are going to talk about. I am going to go through on the preview each week and give you some questions. And we're going to answer them. As we go along, the most exciting game of week zero, which game will that be? And I've got two of them here, and it depends on what you're looking for as far as exciting game, right? For me, uh, there's atmosphere and which game is going to be the closest. I think that that's going to be North Texas at UTEP. Now, that's just a guess on my part. I think that that game is going to be really, really close, and I think having a sold-out Sun Bowl is going to be incredibly exciting. So, that's the direction that I'm going on that one. Um, it appears I might need to shave. If you're watching on this camera, you can, <laughs> you can see I might need to shave before I go to town this weekend. Uh, so, UTEP and North Texas is my number one pick. But if you want the most points, the most explosive plays, etc., I think FAU and Charlotte is going to be your best bet there. Uh, those two, uh, I brought them up. They're playing on CBS Sports Network. That one's a 7 p.m. Eastern time kick. Uh, that one's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, you have got some big play threats in that Charlotte offense, and there's not a whole lot of defense for them. Now, FAU has a little bit of defense. Uh, they they showed out pretty well at Charlotte last year. Can they continue to do so? There were some changes made this offseason. Uh, Todd Orlando is the new defense coordinator for Florida Atlantic. That's going to be tricky. That's going to be tricky for them, uh, especially you know if, if the secondary doesn't hold up against Charlotte. Uh, Charlotte doesn't have much of a running game. May not matter. We'll see. Uh, which game will have the most viewers? I think this one's pretty easy. Nebraska and Northwestern in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, that's that's an easy one. I mean, nothing else even comes close. Uh, none of them are even on networks that are rated other than Nevada and New Mexico State. So it, this is an easy answer. Uh, the most likely 10-plus point dog straight-up winner. Who is an underdog of 10 points or more that can win outright? And that answer is Northwestern. I mean, but I understand that they got whipped 56-7 to last year, but a lot has changed with Nebraska since last season. There's a lot of changeover on that offensive line. Along with that, you don't really have as much of a running quarterback. Casey Thompson can scramble maybe a little bit, but he ain't the running threat that Adrian Martinez was. 
and that offensive line is not nearly as strong as they were last year. On top of that, you have an incredible offensive philosophy shift going on at Nebraska right now because they bring in offensive coordinator Mark Whipple. Now, it is widely known, and if you are a sicko like me and you've been paying attention to this stuff all offseason, Pat Narduzzi talked ad nauseum about the fact that Mark Whipple would never run if he didn't have to. He prefers to pass it all the time, and with Casey Thompson, you've got a quarterback that can throw it every time. Well, if you're doing that, you are throwing right into the teeth of that Northwestern defense. Where they lack is on the defensive line. If you continue to do something against a team that they are better equipped to do or to defend, you could find yourself in some trouble very quickly. And now, of course, we know that this is a pressure cooker situation for Scott Frost. I don't think Pat Fitzgerald has anything to worry about. But, you know, second year under Jim O'Neill, uh, Okay, interesting for the Northwestern defense. Uh, as far as Nebraska goes, I, I would imagine, I mean, they've got, they've got the more talent. They really do. But the way that they could end up going about this could cost them the game. This could be very, very tricky. That line sits at 13 right now. I mean, we'll see what they end up coming out to do. Uh, I do think they have a massive advantage at the line of scrimmage. But if you don't use it, uh, they could end up costing themselves a ball game. So that's what I'm looking at as far as that is concerned. All right, that is going to wrap things up for today. Uh, week one will be significantly better. There's not a whole lot to work with as far as week zero. I mean, you can see it again. Uh, it's just, it's kind of bare bones. But I'll tell you, these are teams that uh, that you want to pay attention to. You want to watch these. You want to figure out exactly what you're getting from these teams in real live action uh, before you start betting in week one, for sure. So, and as we go along, it'll it'll continue to get better. So, uh, oh, oh, let me go ahead and tell you this. Uh, so, I'll be I'll be making some picks on the Thursday shows each week. Uh, I I have been working on my spreadsheet. I'm still working on the spreadsheet, but just to give you a little, you know, idea of what we're looking at here. Uh, this is based on last season's stats. So, as you see, Arkansas ended up winning this game 34 to 17. Uh, my numbers would have had it 35 to 16. So, not bad, uh, but you scroll through. I mean, it's got every kind of stat you could look at. So, we will be able to find the mismatches, uh, and I'm, I'm pretty excited about this. It, it may have more stats than you really need, but it's going to have all of them. It's going to have everything, and you'll be able to see where the difference is for sure. All right, with that said, we are going to get out of here. Thank you to BetUS for sponsoring the show. If you've not already, go sign up over at BetUS.com. There is a link in the description, so take advantage of that. And uh, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we got a lot more stuff that we're going to be announcing next week. Maybe some new shirt designs, et cetera. Go check out the merch store. Make sure that you are subscribed on YouTube and on the podcast as well. Uh, I think that's about it. You guys have been awesome. Follow me on Twitter, at GaryWCE. If you got any questions about games this weekend, et cetera, reach out to me. I am available. I will answer DMs or just straight up tweets, whatever it may be. Or you can always jump into the comments here on YouTube. With that said... We are going to wrap this thing up. You guys are awesome. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. And hopefully, hopefully, all of you tickets cash this week. Thanks for listening to Winning Cures Everything. Make sure and subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. And make sure to leave a nice five-star review. You can follow Gary on Twitter, at GaryWCE. And the show is at Winning Cures. Be sure to check out the merch in our web store and share the show. <laughs>